In the center of the busiest corridor of one of Louisiana's largest cities lie hundreds of acres of fields, forests, and remnants of a lifestyle from an earlier century. Protected from development for future generations, this historically significant property is a gift from a family named Burden, who envisioned working land, open spaces, and scenic beauty for all to enjoy. In the early 1800s, the land that is now home to Burden Museum and Gardens was owned by brothers William and Francis Thomas. Later, when they were not able to pay debts on their property, William Stephen Pike, an early Baton Rouge settler and prominent banker, bought the 600 acres of land for $9,000 at a sheriff's sale. When Pike's niece, Emma Barbie, married John Charles Burden, an agent for an English importer, he arranged for the couple to live on the property. Burden gave up his career as a merchant and began to farm the land. A small winding stream which ran through the property reminded him of a river near his home in England, and he named their home Windrush Plantation. I think one of the most significant things about the beginning was that they moved here right before Fort Sumter, the beginning of the American Civil War. It doesn't take much imagination to realize how difficult times were here. They were not here during the time when the great plantations grew and great wealth was attained, and there wasn't any at that point. The South became poverty-stricken, and most farming efforts concentrated on raising food for individual families. Times were harsh, yet the burdens raised six of their children at Windrush, and then the struggles intensified. With a seventh child on the way, John Charles died from typhoid fever in 1872. He was 38 years old. His wife, Emma, and the children moved to 3rd Street in downtown Baton Rouge. Windrush remained in the Pike family estate. Much like Burden, Civil War veteran Oliver Bryce Steele, a Kentuckian, came to Louisiana to join a mercantile business, first in Morehouse Parish and later in New Orleans. By the end of 1869, O.B., as he was known, moved to Washita Parish and married Juliet Maddie Parks. Captain Steele served in the Louisiana House, the State Senate, and as State Auditor. The couple moved to Baton Rouge in the 1880s, where he served another term as Auditor and co-founded the Bank of Baton Rouge. They had several children, and O.B. Jr. was one, um, and there were three girls. Aunt Ollie was the elder, known as Miss Ollie to everyone. There was Aunt Mamie, Mamie Steele Williams, who married Dr. Lester Williams. And then there was my grandmother, Juliet Steele McNeil. Ollie Steele was 15 when the family arrived at their new home. She attended Burnett's Institute for Girls, studied dance and piano, and joined in girls' club activities. Louisiana State University was only a few blocks away, and it wasn't long before she became involved with social events on campus. It was there that she met LSU cadet William Pike Burden, the youngest son of John Charles and Emma Burden. They were married in July of 1895. The couple settled into a home and began their family on University Walk in Spanish Town. Aunt Ollie had three children. It was I own Pike, then Baby Steele, as they called him, Steely. Their oldest child, I own, enjoyed school and social events, unlike her brothers, Pike and Steele, who were known pranksters. Their father, William Pike Burden Sr., born at Windrush Plantation, remained deeply connected to the property. On December 16, 1905, he was able to purchase the 600 acres of land at $5 per acre from the Pike family heirs. Between 1905 and 1920, they came out here frequently. And it was a trip, travel by horse and buggy to get out here. This was way out in the country, way outside of Baton Rouge at that time. 
Traveling on dirt roads from their downtown home to Windrush was an all-day journey. The entire family loved being out here. This was a summer home, and it, uh, at the time when, um, when the diseases got bad, when there was typhoid or, or illnesses in town, we, the family would come out here. By 1921, the Burdens moved permanently to Windrush. Scarcely four years later, at the age of 55, William Pike Burden Sr. died of heart failure. Aunt Ollie had a, a rough time when Pike died. She was still quite young, yet had three members of the family that she had to provide for. And she would tend to the cattle, she would tend to the mules, she would work in the garden, she had parcels of land that she would lease out. She was responsible for all of this. It was farm people just making a living, trying to sustain their lifestyle to make it to the next day. And it was difficult even to pay the taxes. On several occasions, Miss Ollie's younger sisters, Mamie Williams and Juliet McNeil, were able to help when times were tough. I think that struggle influenced the children, uh, their children, to want to keep it intact as sort of a memory of their family and uh, honor the tradition of their family and their history. And Ollie had a, a love for the property. She had a love for this land. She set the tone for the attitude the whole family had about this place. Uh, she uh, really wanted to keep it together. She was gracious and accepting, but strong and determined about what she wanted. Own was the firstborn, and she was born on Easter, so she was named Own Easter Burden. Own was very, uh, very much a woman of her time. She was like Aunt Ollie in the sense that um, she took care of things. She was in charge. I knew she had to work in the sense that um, Aunt Ollie worked. She saw the hardness of what it took to make a living. But then I was very um, eager to learn. From the time that she was little, I can remember Daddy saying, she always wanted to go to school. She always loved learning. And it was difficult in those days because the women were homemakers. And, but then I own had that drive. My own was uh, the only one to finish a degree. She graduated a bachelor's in English from, from LSU. and went on to a career in college administration, uh, first at Louisiana Tech for a while, and then at William and Mary as assistant to the president for a while before she returned to Baton Rouge and LSU and uh, ultimately became the director of social activities. Everybody knew her, though, because of that, so she, she covered the whole campus. And uh, that was, I guess, the first really strong connection of the Burden family with uh, Louisiana State University. Recognized for her generosity to local organizations, Ione's commitment to Baton Rouge and LSU continued throughout her life. Ione's brother, William Stephen Pike Burden Jr., known as Pike, also attended LSU, but did not share in his sister's love for school. In the spring of 1917, America entered the Great War, World War I, and Pike Burden signed up for the Military Air Corps and learned to fly. These pilots were considered heroes. They were just these daring young men, and Pike fit it, fit that perfectly. Pike was very flamboyant. He liked to be in front of people, and he liked to be the center of attention. He was a amateur magician, and he had a suit with a top hat and traveled all over, gave magic shows, no charge, and he would go to the schools and he would do the magic show. And people remember that, I remember it. Pike was a character. He was a child at heart, and he, he liked to play. 
I think that's how he approached life, was how to perform and create some illusions for people and that sort of thing. He went on to have a, have a successful printing business in Baton Rouge, and I think he printed every check for every bank in town. In 1922, Pike married Jeanette Monroe. The couple lived at Windrush in a modest 700-square-foot house for over 20 years before building a new West Indies style home. Sadly, Pike Burden's health began to fail, yet his love for performance and helping others continued to grow. He had heart problems, and so he was in the hospital a lot in the last years of his life. When he checked in, he always made him put him in the, in the pediatric wards. And uh, he would entertain the kids. Well known for charitable works that benefited children and the elderly, Pike contributed greatly to Our Lady of the Lake Hospital and along with the help of his siblings, Ione and Steele, donated 30 acres of Windrush Plantation land for the Ollie Steele Burden Nursing Home. As a charter member of the Baton Rouge Rotary Club, he founded the Rotarian Cripple Children's Fund and its scholarship for LSU music students. William Stephen Pike Verdon, Jr., a self-made man with twinkling blue eyes, recipient of Baton Rouge's Golden Deeds Award in 1961, died in 1965. The serene atmosphere created by the lush gardens, shaded pathways, and slow-moving waters of Windrush is the life work of the youngest child of William and Ollie Steele Burden, Ollie Bryce Steele Burden, better known as Steele. As a boy, he attended St. Vincent's Academy on North Street, a Brothers of the Sacred Heart school that would later become Catholic High. Steele loved art and was fascinated with the beauty of nature. He was greatly influenced by his grandfather, an amateur painter, art collector, and public servant. He idolized his grandfather, O.B. Steele. He idolized his mother and father also, but he thought his grandfather was bigger than life. He was a state auditor and, and state treasurer. You can imagine Steele being a kid and living in that downtown part of Baton Rouge. Running in and out of the Capitol building was not a big deal, you know, he was all over the place. As his fascination with the world around him grew, 17-year-old Steele enrolled in classes at the nearby campus. He also joined the Student Army Training Corps. They were training uh, the students to um, drill. Steele wanted to join the Army, and of course he was too young. After only a few semesters at LSU, Steele dropped out of school, but his interest and love of the natural world continued. When the family moved to Windrush, it was a working farm with a house in need of repair and fields of cotton, corn, and cows. According to Steele, the place was a cattle run. And that's when Steele Burden started trying to improve on the yard and started doing landscaping. And he was very much interested in creating a, a wonderful world around himself of beauty. He was bringing in elements, forgotten artifacts from the farm and plantation and city and putting them in a garden as a young man, Steele loved to travel, often as a boiler room worker on a freighter headed to Europe or South America. Influenced by the garden landscapes of his journeys, his signature style of garden rooms filled with beautiful plants and statues began to develop at Windrush. And Ollie would get these boxes and these crates, and she what is still sent now, that he was always sending a statue home or some plant. The plant material he used, a lot of people don't think it's very common, but at the time when he was using it, he was trying to develop like a European garden in, in South Louisiana, and you're not gonna do that with the plants we had. So he developed his own plant palette and proved that we can do that. We can have these formal and semi-formal gardens uh, here in the South that are just as beautiful. By 1925, the yard around Windrush was so exquisite that it was written up in the Advocate as a wonderful rural garden reflective of the past of the Burden family. 
as far as uh, maintaining it, there's a lot of work, but he did such a good design that it maintains itself very well. You know, it's not a constant change out on this property. He's done a beautiful job designing it, and we can maintain what he did. Steele's gift for landscape design led to his first full-time job with the city of Baton Rouge, developing City Park. Five years later, in 1930, he began working part-time on the new LSU campus. Following 18 months in the Army at Camp Livingston during World War II, Steele went to work full-time at LSU as the university's landscaper. He worked there until he retired in 1970. Many of the live oaks, magnolias, and crepe myrtles still enjoyed on campus today were planted by Steele Burden. Throughout his life, he developed countless green spaces around the state. Like his sister, Ione, Steele devoted much of his time to the university and to his masterpiece, the 25 acres of flourishing garden rooms surrounding their family home at Windrush. Windrush Gardens was his lifetime work. We sit right here in the middle of it. And the layout of the whole burden complex here was planned and implemented by him. Throughout the years, as Miss Ollie raised cattle and offered the land for sharecropping, Steele continued to portion off sections for landscape designs. He was born in 1900 and died in 1995. He was still working with it at the age of 95. Deeply rooted in the land, the Burden family history is one of struggling to keep the property together. Ensuring its preservation led the Burden children to take steps to honor their parents' labors and traditions. Her three children, two never married, Steele and I own, and Pike married but didn't have any heirs. So the dilemma was in the 1960s, they're all in their 60s, or verging on 70, so what do we do with this property? It was Steele Burden that had this idea, why don't we just leave it as a green space? Why don't we do something to protect it? Why don't we do it in honor of our parents who really strive to make this, keep this property together? And so they all agreed to that. They created the Burden Foundation. They donated the property to the Burden Foundation. Then the Burden Foundation attached a series of covenants to the property. Steel Burden wanted to keep it rural looking. He felt the open space was the heart of the place. The covenant stated that it may not be developed commercially, that it will be focused on horticultural matters, and that the wooded areas will be preserved forever. After these covenants were attached to the deeds, the property was given to LSU in an act of donation. And there's also a provision that says if LSU ever violates the covenants, that the property will flip back to the Burden Foundation. It is a wonderful mechanism to uh, ensure that the Burden's vision for the property is maintained. In October of 1966, I own Burden and Pike's widow, Jeanette, signed documents beginning the donation of family lands to LSU. Steele avoided formal events. At the time, it was the largest gift ever received by the university. By 1992, the final parcel had been given. I think the Burden family saw the place as being maintained as a cohesive whole and a way that people would be able to see what life was like before. It was a way to look back and see not only the physical arrangements of farm life, rural life in the 19th century, but also a way to experience the quiet, the peace, the ambiance of that rural setting. Steele's vision for the property continued to expand. When he noticed a collection of 19th century folk objects and farm tools stored in the university's football stadium, he offered to move the artifacts to his garden studio at Windrush. Eventually, with funding from LSU for a metal building, 
He combined that collection with his own and in 1970 began the LSU Rural Life Museum. Steele's idea was to make it look like Grandpa's barn, Louisiana's attic. So it was kind of organized, but not organized. He did everything wrong from a curator's point of view, but it works because people love going up to the carriages. There's no glass, there's no barrier, and they feel connected. Added to the displays in the barn are paintings, sketches, and clay objects created by Steele depicting life in rural Louisiana. And like his gardens, this was only the beginning. With his own money and help from his sister, I own, Steele was able to purchase and move to Windrush the former slave cabins from Wellham Plantation in St. James Parish. Steele, being the artist and the landscape designer, tried to lay out the buildings, recreating some type of historic landscape around them. So the buildings from Wellham were actually moved and placed back in the same configuration as he had found them at Wellham. Historically, not on the original property, but they're in reference to each other as they would have been 160 years ago. He realized very early in the 1940s and 50s that when people came to Louisiana, they came to New Orleans and they came to the River Road. And when they went to the River Road, all they saw was the big houses. And he thought the most interesting part of a plantation was behind the big house. Soon there were more buildings and objects representing the lives of the working classes, both free and slaves, in rural Louisiana during the 18th and 19th centuries. It's the largest collection of vernacular architecture from the state of Louisiana, and also the largest collection of material culture, artifacts, from farms, houses, plantations, and people's actual items that they gave us. They have a provenance. They're not just things, they're things with a story and a history. Several times I was with Steel when we would drive on to the property there and you go through a few gardens and then you cross a bridge and still envision that bridge as a transition point and several times with steel we would go across that bridge and stop in the great field there and he would say let's get out of the car and we'd get out and stand there and he'd say listen you wouldn't know you were in the middle of a city. He would say it with such feeling, and that was the, the quiet and peace that he saw as a vision for the place. Preserving an atmosphere of serenity and calm was important to the Burdens, but there was more. Ione and Steele Burden also envisioned the property would be used for horticultural research, extension education, and continued development of the LSU Rural Life Museum. They wanted us to maintain the property similar to as they had set it up, but then keeping in mind the mission of our different parts of the Ag Center, uh, more an agricultural mission. The LSU Ag Center's responsibility includes a majority of the property, a little over 400 acres of the 440 acres that's here. And it's very diverse in that we have about a third of it in bottomland hardwoods that's original to the area. The other parts of it, part of it was cleared for farming, the grain crops for the family, and so that is now research plots that we use for different research and extension projects. With a master plan to unify all areas of the property and build a strong connection with the public, today's caretakers the LSU Ag Center, the Baton Rouge yeah, campus, the, the Burden Foundation, the Burden Horticultural Society, and friends and docents of the LSU Rural Life Museum are committed to continue and extend the legacy and dreams of the Burden family. Home to countless varieties of flowers, vegetables, lush forests, wetland plants, and research projects, the LSU Ag Center Botanic Gardens are an ideal place for hands-on learning and a place to experience quiet and peace in a rural setting. The front gardens are primarily to serve a purpose for not only people to see what new plants and materials are out there, but for us to do research as well. 
The entryway through the front gardens begins with a line of camellias that stretch into the fields and almost to Windrush Gardens. We were very fortunate in that a couple for their whole lifetime, Vi and Hank Stone, had collected camellias from all over the world. This collection was really an invaluable collection that had a lot of significant germplasm um, from around the world, but also significant crosses that they had made and introduced to the camellia world that needed to be maintained. When the stones died, their daughter made it possible for the collection to move to the Burden property. There was a connection with the Baton Rouge Camellia Society and the Burden Center and the stones all worked together so it was a natural fit for her daughter to donate those plants to this facility. There's no other place in Baton Rouge that could have housed this collection. There are more than 400 varieties of camellias that complement Steel Burden's original plantings. As visitors enter the Rose Garden, they're greeted with the colorful blooms of thousands of roses, over 1,500 plants that include over 150 varieties. Across from the Rose Gardens is the Orangerie, designed by noted architect A. Hayes Town. It was built in memory of Steel Burden. Based on European garden buildings to store citrus and fruit trees over the winter, the iconic structure recognizes Steel's gifts to the community. Designed to improve learning experiences in a natural environment, the Children's Garden welcomes visitors of all ages. It's a garden that's made up of a lot of different things that you can do very easily that also will integrate in with curriculum. So it may be geography, where we talk about where the plants actually originated from. Um, we have different shapes of planting beds, so you can talk a little bit about geometry maybe in your class, calculate areas and so on. So there's a lot of different themes in that children's garden that are, only, are not fun or learning through play, but also will help meet some of the uh, curriculum standards that teachers have in their classrooms. Following Steele's winding footpaths, five miles of serene walking trails weave through an area known as Burden Woods. Signs identifying plant and animal life can be found along the way. Steele Burden appreciated the woods that were here, and he had a little trail that he would drive through the woods often. We partnered with uh, several different groups, Baton Rouge Green as well as the Junior League of Baton Rouge, to blaze some trails uh, to build on what Steele had already created. The purpose of this, once again, was to create an educational program for school kids. Based on the National Project Learning Trees Environmental Education Program, the Trees and Trails Program uses nature as a pathway of discovery. We created the trails with little educational stations that docent-led programs could be done through the gardens with school kids on field trips. While building the trail areas, the discovery of the remnants of a Tupelo swamp in the rear of the property led to the development of a wetland program. The mosaic boardwalk at Black Swamp has been added to the Trees and Trails adventure. From the moment these kids enter the grounds, they're amazed to find this property here. You know, they see some things that they've never seen in real life before. So it's an amazing thing that we can take them into an urban forest, that we can take them into a garden environment. Um, that they can um, see fruits and vegetables and how they grow and to be able to one? see that some of those visions that the Burden family had from you know a couple of decades ago are coming to reality for the children of our community now. It, it's just a great, great gift to be a part of it. One of Steel Burden's last landscaping projects was the Barton Arboretum. Dedicated to the memory of his close friend, Scott Barton, this peaceful area is reflective of her love of the environment and connects to the trail system. On Arbor Day, visitors enjoy hiking adventures around the Arboretum, tree climbing, and help reforest the Burden Woods area, providing a welcoming green space that enlightens the community of all ages was important to Steel Burden. With the expertise to benefit farmers and the backyard gardener, the LSU Ag Center's heavily research-focused mission has grown to include community-involved educational programs. There aren't many land-grant institutions that have a facility like this in the middle of a very urban area. And so that gives us the opportunity to not only work 
hand in hand with the faculty close to campus and do the research, but also be able to get that information out through our extension programs, both to the industry and to the public, as well as being just a destination for people to come and enjoy. When you come back here to the food and fiber section into our orchards, we host field days for the general public, so we might talk about figs one time at it. We might talk about vegetables or, you know, just different aspects of growing food for yourself. Now, everything we do out here is obviously on a larger scale, but when we're out here and we're talking to the general public versus our growers, we will talk to them about doing it on a smaller size scale. The research aspect for vegetable crops out here is very important for our commercial producers. We grow different things each season because we can grow 30, 40 different types of vegetables in Louisiana. So we'll pick one or two crops that are important to our growers and really focus on those. Sometimes we focus on varieties, so which varieties do best for Louisiana. The significant part of what the Ag Center does for the farmer out here is gives a real life demonstration. We're showing them by doing these field trials here at Burden that what we're saying or what advice we're giving to them actually works in the field. So the farmer can literally put his or her eyes on that crop and see that yes, one is doing better than the other. And then they can take that and replicate it on their own farm. The tradition of farming is deeply rooted in the Burden family story. Looking out across the fields recalls a time when they were dependent on the land for survival. Also reflective of the past are the flourishing garden windows of Windrush. Today, by partnering with local horticulture groups, the LSU Ag Center provides hands-on programs that bring Steele's vision of beauty to the community. 10 or 15 years ago, the master gardeners moved to the Burden property as their kind of footprint, our domicile. We only learned so much in the classroom. So first off, the 80-hour master gardener course is taught here in this property by LSU Extension agents. But where you really start learning it is when your fingers are in the dirt and you're actually doing it with other people who teach you. We do all of our propagating here. We conduct training here. We have training for adults and children. Our big fundraiser is this plant sale. We work on this from September through April and we share our profits with Burden. With an extensive variety of over 8,000 plants for sale, gardening enthusiasts from throughout the community have plenty to select from and trained experts to help. While many plant admirers flock to the botanic gardens, visitors who travel a little further down the road enter into a world of 19th century rural Louisiana. This place is the dream child of Steel Burden. It truly shows who we are and how did we survive and thrive in the past. And it gives you an appreciation of what you have today. The interpretation is strong and the buildings speak for themselves. Uh, many of them have a, a, a unique history. The Neal family makes a pilgrimage to this building. This was their family's home. The ex-slaves of Welland Plantation started this church in 1870. And the descendants of the original congregation come once a year. It's something that's real and tangible, and it's important to them. With more than 67,000 visitors a year, Steele's Grandma's Attic has expanded another 20,000 square feet and includes a visitor center and exhibit gallery, displaying an extensive collection of 18th and 19th century artifacts from rural Louisiana. Baton Rouge has grown up around the property and through the Rural Life Museum we've become very much a public destination, both for the Baton Rouge community but uh, in places beyond. La maison est surélevée. French people feel very affiliated with Louisiana. They feel very close to Louisiana. They want to get a perspective on how life was here at the time that their ancestors were colonizing here. We do tours in English and in French, and we're going to start doing them in Italian, and we already have set up tours in German. We do reenactments, historical reenactments. We have events throughout the year like Easter and Christmas and um, we have harvest days in the fall and we uh, show um, children or adults how, to, how things used to be done in the 19th century. 
creating a place for understanding Louisiana's history and a better environment for the community was important to the Burden family. Today, through the many programs at LSU Rural Life and LSU Ag Center Botanic Gardens, volunteers help fulfill and expand their vision. It's opened up for so many people to enjoy agriculture in the middle of this busy cement city, uh, a place to, to commune with nature, a place to be at peace. You're out here, you enjoy it. You learn and you become addicted to getting your hands dirty and doing all the things that, that happen on this property. This is my refuge. <laughs> this is peace. This is, um, this is connecting. And I enjoy being there. It's good for me. You ask yourself the question is, why do all these people choose to do that? Why do they do that? And I think it's because they see the original vision of the burdens and that being an island of tranquility and that being something that is good and something that will help us to understand who we are and how we got this way. And uh, so it attracts people. They're, they find that of value, so they support it. Moss-laden trees arch high above the winding paths and lush gardens of Windrush at Burden Museum and Gardens. Colorful vistas, trails, and farmlands cover the landscape. Over 440 acres of land preserved and forever protected. It's a gift from the Burden family to the people of Louisiana and to visitors from around the world.